You are listening to episode 31 of the R Podcast. Hello, and thank you so much for tuning in to episode 31 of the R Podcast. My name is Eric Nance, and I am coming to you from Denver, Colorado, as I am attending the Joint Statistical Meetings, or JSM for short, uh, conference this year. I've had a pretty well-rounded experience. I'm actually recording this on the night before I head back home, but I wanted to take a little bit, a few minutes to share some of my insights from what I attended to from the sessions and also some great conversations I've had and insights um, outside the sessions. So um, with this event, I, this is bringing back a lot of memories. So this is technically the third time I've been at JSM. And ironically, my first ever JSM was 11 years ago, right here in Denver. Uh, my life was a lot different back then, but this was So if I do the math correctly, this is 2008, Um, I was asked to present my research that I had worked on during a summer internship, and originally my supervisor was going to be flying to give it, but then she wasn't able to make it due to different reasons, and she asked me to do it. And this is right after, this is a year after my internship ended, and I was trying to wrap up my dissertation, which was also an extension of that research. And then out of the blue, I got the call and I definitely appreciated the opportunity. I thought, well, sure, why not? (laughs) Young back then, you never know what you're getting into. Um, But I do remember uh, flying out here and man, did I practice that presentation (laughs) so much. And it wasn't very long, it was maybe 15 minutes, but that was at that time, the first time I've ever spoken at, you know, whoever big or small audience, but more importantly, in a non-classroom setting. And I knew that in the back of my mind that if I did a decent job of this, hopefully that would maybe put a good word in for, you know, getting a real job after that. And sure enough, yeah, things worked out well. But as I'm going in the hotel and I'm walking around to the convention center, yeah, the memories definitely flood back. And I remember uh, during that trip, my mom was able to come join me, and we had a lot of great conversations. And you know, she helped help me practice and reassure me when I got up there and nervous as heck, being that young kid almost still. But but yeah, it was definitely surreal to be back here. And now I've been working a little bit of years. And ironically, the other thing I remember is that this was literally probably right near when I was starting to use R for the first time in a in a course and not so much the very first time but this is the time I was starting to really get into the details about R because um, I talked about this way back in episode one but my dissertation research um, and my my dissertation itself would not have been possible without R and this is when I was really starting to take my learning to another level albeit going from almost scratch over the one time series course. And yeah, now I look back to where I'm at today. Yeah, I might say I know a little bit more, but man, the, the world has changed a lot in the in the art community in terms of not just art, but the packages itself and everything around it. And these days at JSM, you, you see how dominant R is in many parts of the workflow. In fact, one funny thing that I remember in the past couple of days was the night I got here, they were having a little mixer poster session and I'm walking around the ex- the exhibition hall and I don't know the context of the statement, but one of the people at maybe one of the booths or something like that said, you know, today R is king. And I was just almost wanting to turn around and be like, yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> but I, I kept walking, but I was like, yeah, times have definitely changed since the first time I was at JSM for sure. So um, got to meet a lot of familiar faces. Um, 
a lot of, you know, people I haven't seen in a long time. And then also some new faces that I've been wanting to meet again or meet online. Um, but I want to share some stories about kind of my experience. I'll keep this quick because I want to make sure I get you to our interview shortly. Um, but at, and the first day, full day I was here, I gave my, um, I was invited to do a talk about using Shiny effectively with best practices and life sciences. And I think it went well. It seemed like the audience is really engaged and we had lots of great questions and the rest of the panel and that talk did a really great job too. And it was gratifying to hear the, our last speaker, our kind of discussant, if you will, um, he had, when he did a summary of my presentation, he was quick to say, you know, I want to share what Eric has told us with the rest of my team, because yeah, this helps with leveraging shiny in a more effective setting and getting around some, what some might call limitations on how you do the processing behind it. So it was really nice to see something be useful and hopefully we can keep some collaborations going in the future. Um, the industry I work in is now really starting to adopt shiny a lot. I want to make sure we're using it, you know, in the most effective way possible and learn from others, both within the industry and even outside it going forward. Um, so yeah, that was, that was good. And I also met, um, a very proficient, uh, the developer of packages and some JavaScript, and he's actually written a package that our, our team not my immediate team, but it's my colleagues at, at work are using for visualizing um, safety data. It's called Safety Graphics, and um, it's written by Jeremy Wildfire. So, Jeremy, if you're listening to this, great job, and it's been great to meet with you, and I'm sure we'll hopefully cross paths again in the future. Um, but, yeah, it's a different time now. We are really at the forefront of hopefully um, harnessing interactive visualizations and shiny and html widgets around that so that's a perfect segue to talk about what was um my favorite session to actually attend in the audience and that was a panel discussion called why javascript because um when we heard the uh, organizer of the session kind of give the motivation for it it was from the perspective of a lot of people are either teaching statistics or been involved in just the typical statistics field and they may be able to go a long way without having to look at, you know, interactive frameworks and more, more to the point, a different language like JavaScript. So it's more about what are the things we should be pay, paying attention to from the statistics side of things. And is it worth the learning hurdle and everything like that? We had a great panel um, that was in this session, um, Carl Broman, who... Uh, many of you know from the R community, um, he's given great talks in the past. He gave his insights on why JavaScript was fun, and that was interesting to see. And then Carson Sievert, who is now a software engineer on the Shiny team at our studio, he gave a slightly different take on it where it was, yes, JavaScript is great, but we now have a lot of tooling around it that makes it a lot easier for those of us that are becoming more proficient and using R for visualization, using things like Shiny for the interactivity of web applications, and also the foundation that HTML widgets has laid for us, that a lot of these great frameworks, of course, Plotly comes to mind because Carson's been heavily involved with that, and many others, they're giving us an easy API that's you know all within the R framework to give our analyses, whether it's reports or shiny apps, that extra interactivity and not have to be JavaScript wizards to build all that. So it was great to hear him say that because you might expect someone that's been developing a very influential framework that, of course, is based in JavaScript. They might say, oh, yeah, you should definitely learn everything about it. But no, he took a very pragmatic approach, which I really appreciate. And then um, Romnith, who um, those of you may know, um, the author of the HTML widgets package himself, um, he gave a, a talk about his journey of the idea of how HTML widgets came to be. And he even took a chance and did a live demo of creating an HTML widget from scratch um, with a simple JavaScript framework that will let you put kind of a tooltip around points on a line graph. 
and he got it done in six minutes. I'm really impressed, even with maybe one or two typos, but he knew where to look, and once it was created, it's done. So what's interesting to me is that now these days, I think the time is right to embrace these technologies, but from my perspective, of course, I'm going to take what some might say the easy way out, and if things like Plotly do everything I need, my gosh, I'm going to use Plotly. But there are times where maybe these HMO widgets that have been built don't quite do everything you need. And that's when I can see there is an important need to at least have some basic knowledge of JavaScript. Certainly you don't, I'm guessing here, you don't need to be a huge expert if you're just doing simple extensions or adding some simple interactions with your shiny app for example but i suppose if you want to get in the space of customizing something from scratch via something like d3 then you probably do want to know more details about the language but it was a great question and answer session as well i particularly asked about performance and some ways around that and so carson gave me some nice things to follow up on and really, um, actually, Jeremy was sitting next to me when we were at this session. He brought up good points about, sure, you may have huge data sets, but you still need to look at best practices for how you expose that to your, to your audience. It's not always the best case to just dump everything in one visualization. Maybe there's some summaries you can look at and let the user drill down based on those summaries Hence, you don't necessarily need to get every single data point in a visualization. So there's definitely some responsibility to using all of this, on and that follows with any visualization. But JavaScript is no different there. I think what people maybe get mesmerized about is the fact that now it's not just a great-looking visualization, it's an interactive great-looking visualization. Um, so I've, I've got a lot of points to ponder on that I took notes of during the session. And I think going forward, I'm going to start looking at the great documentation around things like Plotly. In fact, Carson is writing or at least revising his online book about using Plotly with R. And there's lots of nuggets there that even for Shiny itself, if you pay attention to it, it can help make your apps even more responsive and hopefully more of a better experience for your audience. Um, but yeah, speaking of Carson, so I've, I've met him a few times at other conferences, but this was a great, we had a great um, situation pan out where um, on Monday afternoon, after I had seen one of the sessions, I was, I was shooting him a message asking if we could talk a bit because he and Joe Chang have authored a new package in the Shiny ecosystem called Shiny Meta, which is meant to help bring a lot of reproducibility to your Shiny app such that you can basically plug in certain um, switches to reactives and observers and renderers and kind of get code that you would maybe type out yourself, but it's being produced by Shiny automatically. And it's not like the shiny code being copy pasted. It's as if it's the code that you would write from scratch using the same data or same input artifacts and then leveraging the package to make like an R markdown report with a compiled like PDF or whatever have you, or even just an R script that has this code in and you, you kind of do what you want afterwards. But it captures the interactions of the app at that time that you have, say, save that, save that result. So this package is going to be huge for me personally with some of the workflows I have to deal with in my day job to basically assure my, my audience for the app that we have a way to extract, at least when you finish like doing some data drilling down or finish um, you know, manipulating that plot, that we can get the code that did all that interaction at that point in time, and you can put that somewhere for reproducibility. Um, especially in my industry, that has been a huge problem, and I'll definitely explore this more technically, likely in future um, episodes of the Shiny Developer Series. Now, of course, this package is early days, so I wanted to talk to him about some ideas I had on using this and being an early adopter for it, 
and we just got in a great technical discussion about it. And it was great to see that he had ideas where I could start contributing right now, even if it is starting with making sure the documentation makes sense from a shiny user perspective and the long-term vision that they have for the package. And it's always, sometimes it seems like a cliche that when you see a package that's being talked about that's new, they say, well, we're still working on the API. It's maybe not quite stable. So be prepared for breaking changes. And yeah, they may be bringing some breaking changes as I was starting to use this package about a week or so ago before I came to this conference. But I'm okay with that risk because I'm so, I feel so strongly about this workflow that I'm willing to take the little paper cuts, if you will, during this process to make sure that this can appease those concerns I've had and make sure that me and others in the Shining community don't have to reinvent this paradigm from scratch every time we do a new app. So I'm very excited for it, but it was great to talk to Carson about this and a lot of other issues. Um, so yeah, Carson, if you're listening, it was excellent talking with you in this detail and I'll be seeing him again, hopefully next month when I go to another conference um, in August. So yeah, that was great, great experience on that front. So I feel like I've gotten some pretty useful out of this conference, you know, give a short talk, get some great technical insights from Carson about you know, Shiny and JavaScript. And then, yeah, attending those, that discussion today was very eye-opening and yeah, I got a lot of follow-up to do. And then one of the other sessions I attended, um, and that kind of ties into the interview I'll play for you shortly, is we are at a time where teaching data science now can have a whole new look to it. And there's a lot of great tooling out there to make that a lot easier. And also finding there's a lot of developments into what's the best way to effectively teach this, again, from both the tooling perspective and just how you engage the audience, whether it's a workshop or an actual class at a university or high school, whatever have you. And so I really wanted to take take a moment or at least spend some time highlighting what great advances there have been in teaching data science, especially with R heavily involved within it. And I thought no better opportunity than the um, talk with two of the members of our studio's education team, one of which I met um, earlier this um, this year at our studio conf, Allison Hill. Um, if you recall from one of my previous episodes, she and Ewei, um authored the Advanced R, R Markdown Workshop, and it was really well done. They really prepared a lot. And I only saw technically the finished product of it because I was a TA added pretty late to the process. But at the same time, it was great to see it in action. But I always wanted to kind of get under the hood, so to speak, on not just the technical side of it, but the kind of the strategic or philosophical side to it. So I was able to attend Allison's uh, talk at JSM about some of the insights that she learned from teaching data science at the university she was at prior to joining our studio. And that got me thinking as well that, gosh, there's a lot of great ideas here that that talk could only scratch the surface of. And then I also knew that at JSM, another member of the Art Studio education team, uh, Mina Chetankaya Rundell, oh, well, now I got that right. You'll see in the interview, I did not. <laughs> um, she's also been doing a lot of work at her, um, at her teaching both previously at Duke and now at the University of Edinburgh. And she's also been quite passionate about the tooling and getting an effective way to implement these best practices for any kind of data science teaching. So I thought this would be a great chance to really dive deep into some of the, the issues that they've had to overcome and what are some of the insights and best practices that we all can learn from no matter if we're in the academic setting or if we're even in the industry and we have to help others in our organizations learn R or learn parts about R as well. So with that uh, long-winded introduction to this, let's now play my chat with Allison and Mina. 
Welcome back, everybody. We are on location at the JSM Conference 2019 in the Mile High City of Denver. We are on the Tuesday evening, and I'm very excited to be joined by uh, two members of our studio's education team who I've met previously and really admire their work. Um, we are joined by Allison Hill and Mene Chintankaya. We'll see if we added that. Um, but yes, uh, thank you for joining me. Um, first, if could each of you kind of describe what your current role is and the kind of tasks you do at our studio on the education team? Uh, so I joined the education team last October, and uh, this is Allison. <laughs> um, and uh, my role is a data scientist and professional educator there, um, and I've been working to develop workshops for teaching people how to use our markdown better in their workflows. Um, and then I'm also working on several projects for creating scalable learning materials for other educators to use or for self-directed learners to use um, without necessarily being able to rely on having the one-to-one -one interaction that uh, you get in a normal workshop. Um, and this is Mina. I joined our studio in the summer of 2016, so it's been a while now that I think about it. Um, I'm also on the education team, and I focus, I think I have like two primary focuses as part of my education role there. One is developing uh, teaching materials and computing infrastructure guidance for people primarily teaching in like a university setting, so in-person setting, um, and running some workshops for teaching data science in that setting. And I also work with the Shiny team on developing education materials and workshops and documentation and stuff like that for Shiny as well. Great, great. We're going to hit on a lot of different concepts, but they're all going to tie into, I think, the awesome uh, initiatives and efforts you all been doing to make learning easier, especially in data science with a focus being in R itself. So one thing I gleaned on uh, the, your talk yesterday, Allison, and some of your previous talks, I mean, is that engaging students early on is so critical in, in data science and especially and then when you don't have that engagement, it can be really challenging to bring them back in speed so that they can, you know, really engage in the course material and things like that. So I'm really curious what kind of techniques have you worked, have you done previously or now that have helped you bring that engagement early on for the students so that they're motivated to keep going with what could be pretty complicated material, but hopefully make it fun for them, too. Um, I'll start. I, my technique for that is starting with data visualization. So I, I teach a lot of students who have no computing background, so this might be the first time they're writing code. Um, and I like doing so through kind of the lens of data visualization, and data science is a domain that allows for that. So we start by drawing pictures, basically. Um, that's how they learn to reason about data, but that's also how they learn to do computing. And it is... Um, I, th I think that is engaging because it's kind of empowering to see, uh, you know, visualization come together. Yeah, yeah. And um, it, it's not necessarily simple to make, um, you know, complex visualizations that are actually worth looking at. But for that purpose, we leverage things like our Markdown and our Studio Cloud that basically takes out all the infrastructure and set up out of the question so we can get students started with just like, knitting a document, seeing what things look like, and making small tweaks, and then breaking it down and building it back up again. Excellent. How about you, Allison? Uh, I basically follow the same pattern that Mine does, um, especially focusing on data visualization, but also for a lot of the our Markdown and Friends tools. Um, I'm, I'm really focused on trying to get people to be able to have materials on their computer that they can play with immediately. So I'm I'm really interested in developing more templates, things that you can just immediately kind of populate into your workspace and kind of get your hands dirty and start playing around with files, being able to see what a knitted document looks like, but also if you're working with our Markdown collections, being able to build those things really quickly right. so that you can get that kind of satisfaction to be able to see something kind of beautiful, which I think is also what you, know, you see when you do a data visualization, but also when you're maybe building a book with Bookdown or building a blog with blog down, those kinds of like really initial great feelings that you get when mm -hmm. you build it for the first time and you see something amazing pop up that's like in your HTML viewer that you didn't have to do much work for. I think that's a really nice like encouraging moment for you to want to keep going and want to learn more. 
yeah, boy, I wish that stuff was around when I was starting out with this um, much different world. Um, you're kind of hitting on a point we'll talk to as we go forward about the tooling behind all this. But one thing that was admittedly frustrating to me, maybe now looking back after the fact, is when I was learning statistics and then, you know, we had a lot of, I would say, proprietary lock-in to tools, whether it's just straight office products or even the stat programs that we use. Um, from your experience, but both of you being either currently or formerly involved in academia, do you sense departments are now starting to embrace open source more for teaching and the tooling around that? Um, I would I would hope yes, but I'm curious what you've been seeing in the ground, so to speak. Um, I think my experience is yes, but I think um, the at least in my experience, there was not much resistance to open source per se. I think there's resistance in general because uh, in many departments you have faculty who don't know the open source tools. So mm. it's not just the transition to open source tools that you think about. You have to be able to transition a faculty member to be able to teach that course sure. and to be able to troubleshoot and help students and feel fluent in it and be able to answer questions. And I think those are things that are harder. Um, you need some professional development, uh, you know, plan for those faculty to transition and also a motivation for them to want to change because right. it's conversion of a whole course is really hard. So I, I guess I feel like there's multiple places of friction and it's not so much friction that I observed at least in my uh, groups as resistance to open source per se, but more as like it's an infrastructure change. You have to pay these people time to convert a whole course over to a new language and then be able to build up the faculty to be able to support that material going forward. Um, in my in my own training, like in my PhD, and then where I've worked at, um, like teaching as well, we I had not had any sort of resistance to open source, but that's because I was in the statistics domain and not in one of the departments where they're more tied to things like SAS and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I, I I grew up in an R environment, and then I was teaching in an R environment, so that was all fine. But I also work with a lot of other stats educators who make different choices for a variety of reasons. Um, I think what Allison said is right. It's about change of any sort as opposed to change towards open source. Um, but I think some things that have been helping is, first of all, the um, closed source companies themselves. Some of the stuff is really, some universities are simply priced out of it. Oh, you know, sure. They are expensive, yeah. so that's one reason for change. I think industry choosing Open source tools means students want to be learning them in their undergraduate career. So that's also a reason for motivation. And also the thing that a lot of the um, kind of paid software uh, products will have is an academic license that might appear free to the students because they don't have to pay. The university perhaps pays for a license. Mm -hmm. But what happens is once they graduate, they can't use it anymore. So right. I think it took it takes a while for the faculty to realize that's the case because they never graduate, sure, right? right? So they always <laughs> stay with the academic license. Yeah. But I think hearing more from students that this is a tool that didn't grow with me because I can't use it at the place where I'm at um, mm -hmm. has helped some of the change towards open source. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, I think it's never been a better time to be a student of these <laughs> things than now. And hopefully more departments are opening their eyes, so to speak, on making sure we're using these tools effectively, but maybe taking that investment in time to, I know, like you said, Allison, rewriting a course is immensely painful, especially if you've been doing it for years and then suddenly someone says, oh, have you tried to do a different approach? So um, I, luckily I've only was a TA one semester and I reused some material, although I saw gaps in it and I was like, can we make that a little more interactive? But back then I had to code some in PHP to do it. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> we didn't have Shiny back then, folks. <laughs> I'm old, what can I say? Um, but it's uh, much easier with some of the tooling, um, I would say. Um, now, obviously, me not being in academia right now, me being in industry, um, I a lot of the emphasis we do is trying to have these focus workshops to engage, you know, our either our colleagues or prospective colleagues with material. Um, those that listen to the show know that I was fortunate enough to be a, a very low-level TA for the Advanced Hour Markdown workshop that Allison and Ewei led um, earlier this year. And I got to see the finished product, so to speak, but I know there was a ton of prep work involved for that. But I'm curious, did your experience being in an academic institution help you with how you would structure a workshop and have it to be as successful as, well, at least in my opinion, it was in early this year? Let's see if you could expand on that a little bit. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, it, it was an interesting experience developing that um, uh, workshop. And I think 
I think, yeah, definitely the experience in academia, it was, for me, it was more freeing because I was able to actually teach the tools that often in academia I didn't feel like I could really spend time teaching um, because uh, at least in my previous academic position, I was teaching on the quarter system, which is 12 weeks. These are really short chunks of time that you have. And so you often have to prioritize um, teaching more content and less about the tooling. And so the, the Advanced Art Markdown workshop that you're referring to was, was heavy on the tooling and not so much on you know data visualization or data science. Sure. It was more like, you want to build this thing, here's how you do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's a, a Flex dashboard that you can build. Here's a book down book that you can build. Here's a blog yeah. down site that you can build. And we just built things. Um, and for me, that was kind of freeing because we were seeing a lot of students in that class who had all these use cases for building these things, but right. were... Uh, unsure where to start always Um, because for all of the different things there's always a slightly different starting point there's always a slightly different function to call to get all the files in place there's always a slightly different build command Um, it's always slightly different to publish or deploy the thing Um, so so I think for me it was um, it was a really fun experience in that sense but also it was the first time I had taught we taught five packages in one day um, which was a lot I would not do that again I know right (laughs) (laughs) Um, but I think for me it was also um, uh, interesting to see all of a sudden when you teach those back to back, you realize the inconsistencies between the different the different packages and, and how it is hard to to pick up something new, even if you know one of the other ones, it's almost harder because you're dealing sure. with that interference. But um, but certainly, I think uh, my experience teaching in academia helped me prepare for that workshop. But definitely, my experiences since then at our studio have also made me. Uh, further develop my ways of thinking about teaching those different tools mm-hmm. um, in, in slightly different ways and probably in more uh, more spread out ways. Sure, <laughs> Not sure. so much five at a time in one day. <laughs> yeah, that was, <laughs> that a, was lot. a lot. I know, yeah. So, Mina, I know you've done workshops in the past. Could you expand a little bit as well? Yeah, I've um, I've done workshops. I've done for, at our studio comp, I've taught an R Markdown and Shiny workshop before. And last last year, I was actually part of the team doing the teaching certification workshop. So that was oh, a whole yes. other experience. Um, I had not necessarily... I've taught... Um, I've taught teachers before, so it was something I'm somewhat familiar with, but doing so with two other kind of really um, good instructors, Garrett and Greg Wilson, was it was a lot of fun, and I think we got a lot out of it as well, and I know that Greg's been working on the teaching certification program for our studio, and a lot of what we learned during that workshop got rebuilt back into the training materials for that, so that's Great. been good to see evolve. Yeah, it's, it was exciting to see some of those efforts too, and I think whether it's a workshop or even back to a classroom setting, I do think that you can go a long way in R these days about having a lot of programming experience. You know, maybe you never did a language before R. Maybe you have, and it's a totally different language. That's another story for another day. Um, but I now maybe I'm being opinionated here. I still think it's kind of good to have a basic understanding of some maybe debugging techniques or other development concepts because then if you have things that go haywire, you have uh, you have ways to maybe troubleshoot that a little bit better. So I don't know how you've been able to, in your whatever your previous courses or in your workshops, kind of strike the balance between not overwhelming them right away of a lot of programming concepts, but giving them just enough so they can kind of navigate out of that hole that they might fall into if they're getting tripped up by like not being able to do a ggplot correctly or getting in a dplyr pipeline gone horribly wrong. I don't know what where do you strike the balance there or if there is such a balance. I'm not sure necessarily where exactly the right balance is, but something I'll say is that I think the best troubleshooting technique is to not be afraid of the error and be willing to Google it. Uh And, you know, that doesn't require a whole lot of knowledge of programming per se. It is just actually not being afraid to ask questions when you fail. It's just Mm -hmm. you're typing the question by copying and pasting it into Google. I think one of the things that helps a lot with that is to do sorts of live coding in class because however, you know, good or experienced or expert user of R or any language you might be, at some point you're going to make a mistake, even if it's a small typo and your students seeing how you reason through, oh, this must just be a typo versus no, this is an error we should Google, um, I think is really helpful for them to see. So exemplifying troubleshooting instead of going through like, the theory of troubleshooting with Mm -hmm. them as bullet points, but instead exemplifying, I think, goes a long way. And the other thing I will say is, um, I think to be considered a competent R programmer, at some point, some of these more perhaps 
things that might be considered traditional CS topics will perhaps come about. Mm-hmm. My thought about all of this is it's just not all of this has to come on day one. Ah. So we don't have to start in like the chronology of things. I think we can get people doing stuff. And then I think it's really nice to um, create scenarios in the classroom, active learning scenarios where people will fail. Like you set them up to fail for a little bit because you actually have a ready-made solution for them, even if that solution is, you're about to see an error. When you see it, go ahead and Google it. I think even that sentence is a lot better, easier the first time around than unexpectedly seeing an error. So creating these scenarios in class and having students do them a few times in a protected environment before <laughs> they go home and struggle, and then telling them, you will struggle, and this is part of the deal, and exemplifying them, I think, goes a long way. Excellent points. I totally agree with that. And I think um, one of the things that um, I think a lot about when I'm starting off with a new topic or, you know, something new for a new group of learners is I've really embraced the idea of learner personas, which Greg Wilson um, is a big proponent of yeah, we're on touch our team. On that. Yeah, right. um, because I think that that sort of guides you to think about what are the actual problems that they'll need to solve early on. Um, you know, if they're going to be a person that is going to be doing, you know, R for programming, then, you know, maybe you'd want to you know, prioritize those kinds of lessons earlier on. Whereas if they're a medical researcher and they're trying to use our markdown to create a, a paper based on some real data from a site that they're getting data from, sure, uh, that's a very different problem solving technique um, and, and things that you'd want to teach them and prioritize. You know, you can tell what errors they're going to run into. Like I can tell you that you're going to run into file paths as a problem. You know, yeah. you're going to run into, you know, things maybe with uh, knit chunks having the duplicate names. Like there's, there's all kinds of different yep. errors depending on which path you pick and what tool you're teaching. So I think... Mm-hmm exemplifying the errors, showing them and being able to anticipate what they're going to run into based on their use cases is really important. And I think just as a psychologist, I think sometimes uh, it's interesting to hear when people always uh, kind of think, you know, in hindsight, I wish I had known this earlier. So I think they always want to teach that earlier. Oh, sure. But yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean that the learner's path needs to follow what you kind of wish you had had because you probably <laughs> didn't have that earlier either. So it's, yeah. it's sort of like, you know, I, just because we wish we had learned it maybe a little earlier or I wish I had known that doesn't necessarily, you know, negate the learning path that you were on to begin with. It doesn't mean that the order was wrong to start. Um, right. So, you know, it's okay to be a little bit shocked maybe by a new piece of knowledge or to mm-hmm. be like, oh, wow, that's a tool I didn't know about and I wish I'd known earlier. It doesn't mean right. that you should have learned it on day one in addition to all the other stuff that you learned too. So I think it's kind yeah. of important not to necessarily personalize our own experiences too much and put that on other people that they need to follow that same the path that I wish I had taken because you don't know that that actually would have been better for you either right right I do remember some moments when I was learning shiny early on and the concept of reactivity just way over my head it wasn't until the shiny devcon that Joe Cheng sat us down for two hours and drilled it into us what the like the methodology and the purpose of it was and now I feel like going through that yeah, did I learn the right way beforehand? Oh, absolutely not. But at the same time, that journey was still worth it. So sometimes it's good to have that perspective of, yeah, it's not always the right path initially. But if you are teaching this to someone else, there's a balance between showing them the right path almost too quickly and not letting them think a little on their own, so to speak. And I have been guilty of that in the past where I've shown them the perfect solution and they're like, hey, it's magic. We're unicorns. We're all going to be happy now. And then they do something else afterwards and they break it and they have no idea where to go from there. So I've tried to be better when I do internal workshops of keeping that perspective in mind. But I do want to parse on a point you mentioned about this learner personas concept that Greg Wilson has been mentioning. And Greg is the head of the RCA education team, if I re- Oh, and you're not head of that? Greg is a member of the R-Studio oh, Education oh, okay. team, but there's a director of uh, education at R-Studio named Carl Howe. Who oh, Carl. Is, I yeah. get them too confused. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, back, yeah, so back to the personas, it's something that maybe subconsciously I kind of thought about, but never really saw it articulated as well as I've seen in this. So I'm curious from your perspective, how, how are you able to use that concept no matter what type of teaching you're doing, whether it's a workshop or like in, in the academic classroom with you know college students, how how far can we take this learner persona method 
in terms of educating people going forward. I mean, I think you can take it far, and I think that it actually does appear in academic settings already. Now, it's not necessarily called that, but so if you're proposing a new course to teach, you'll have to fill out a form that has a question like, what is the prerequisite knowledge? Who is the intended audience? What are prerequisite courses? These mm -hmm. are actually all types of things that go into the consideration of learner personas. I think... I think one nice touch of learning personas in addition to that is we really have the word person in there, like kind of trying to think about the full package of what, what this person's needs might be in a learning environment, what their learning goals might be, as opposed to just thinking about it as what background knowledge they're coming in with. So I think in at least the academic like new course proposal form setting, it tends to get a little bit more stuck on the background knowledge and stuff like and like what year students are and stuff. But I think there it's all the same intention. And I think you obviously you have to think about who your target audience is, I think learning personas are a really good way of um, articulating that and also realizing that there are multiple learner personas yes. for any material that you're teaching. And ultimately, you are trying to fit one size to all, but you should design that one size with like the various learning personas in mind. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the most powerful things about the learner personas for me has been thinking about collaborative course development. So it makes it so that, you know, if you're working with another instructor on developing course materials, it's really a nice way to get on the same page really early on uh, and keep everything kind of funneled in the right direction. Because otherwise, if you don't have the same people in mind that you're designing a you know, a lesson or a workshop for, you could end up going off in totally different directions, assuming different prerequisite knowledge or different motivations for the students. Right. Um, so I think for for that purpose, I think it's been really powerful. Um, and for those people who don't know, we uh, we have, I think, a blog post on learner personas. Yeah, I'll um, put a link in the show notes. Yeah, really yeah. Um, yeah. So, so internally, at least at our studio, we may not always share our learner personas for an individual like tutorial or workshop, but we typically try to identify like three learner personas that we think would benefit from this and be interested in this content yeah. and I think the thing that I, I really like about thinking about it that way is that I used to always at least have like sort of some stereotypical student in my head um, <laughs> which was usually like one person that may have been more of like that unicorn type of person who you know is like sort of a jack of all trades and this this makes you kind of put them into bins a little bit and say like okay so there's these three people and I need to make sure that at least those three po three people would be happy if they were taking my course and even if only those three people were happy that's better than one um, and so that's kind of been a powerful concept for me in thinking about developing materials is you can't please everybody you're not going to be everything to everyone but if you're ever everything to these three people, <laughs> then you've covered at least three people. And what you can hope for is that those personas, you know, encompass more than one person each, right? right, <laughs> like, right. So it, it's been really kind of powerful to help you free up a little bit of cognitive energy to be able to focus on the things that matter when you're developing content. Yeah, what well, was funny is I was going to the site that describes some of these learner personas. There was one in particular that was literally about my industry of somebody that was very resistant to learning something new like R, where they were able to get their job in another language and there's no real motivation to learn. So it is, and I deal with that audience most of the time. It's like, how do I motivate them to show that there's, a, there's another side to this that if you just invest a little bit, you'll be able to do a lot more potentially. But yeah, but it, yeah, easier said than done. But it was great to see that articulated in such a nice way that I hope other those that are either teaching, whether it's a small thing or a bigger effort, can take take knowledge of that. Um, it I'll, sort of it sort yeah. of makes it a little bit more fun when you're collaborating with someone else because you can give feedback and be like, well, you know, would Raul benefit from this information? You yeah. know, you talk more <laughs> about these like these you know imaginary personas as real people, and it just makes it a little bit easier to to iterate on a lesson like, you know, well, is this really something that Beatrice needs to know on day one? You know, it, yeah. it makes it a little bit more fun than kind of a little bit more of a pedantic conversation where you're going back and forth on lesson content. Like you really are thinking about real people. Right. Yeah, it's it's finding that right balance. But I think, again, I just when I was in like doing that TA course, they don't tell you any of this stuff. You just got to learn on the fly. So I'm glad that there are others that are researching this quite well. Um, Let's just a little bit to the tooling for a second, because I think, at least in today's ecosystem of R, things like R Markdown have become just almost like a foundation layer of all these other extensions built on top, which you kind of mentioned, Allison, a little bit already. Um, 
what I'll, I'll just ask kind of what is your favorite part of that tool chain that's enabling what you're able to do like at a different scale than maybe you were in the past and what areas do you think could be better? I'll just leave it at that. Do you want to go? Or should I? Um, let's see, favorite in the tool chain of like the R Markdown oh, family? Yeah, the, similar to that or just how you, how you teach basically. Well, R, yeah. um, I guess for me, um, I've been kind of going through a we're doing a summer project with an intern um, this year, and we're going through and kind of looking at all the different R Markdown, R Markdown collection, uh, collection making tools, like anything that you know can help you knit together more than a single document. So looking at like, you know, R Markdown sites, book down, blog down, distill, all of these now that are out there, um, and we've been kind of comparing notes on like the the positives and the negatives and that's been sort of fun to see um, and thinking about different use cases for different kinds of people um, and so I've been excited about Bookdown recently for a number of reasons we're building this a, a book for educators in Bookdown and that's been really fun to see uh, how an intern that I'm working with is making like intense customizations to Bookdown cool. uh, that are making it really much more fun and usable for me uh, to use and it's um, it sort of changed my mind about Bookdown a little bit um, for myself uh, because I always had defaulted to blog down previously because I yeah. really liked um, really liked the the structure of a blog down project. But mm -hmm. uh, it's also been really interesting to think about um, different people's approaches to workflows and sense of organizing their projects. So I think all of the different kind of packages for developing multiple R Markdown tools have different uh, ways that their directory is going to get structured. And so we've been kind of thinking a little bit more about like, you mm. know, when it's just a dump of a bunch of documents, like, you know, <laughs> uh, how, how tolerant are you of that? Yeah, <laughs> and how sure. much do you want to update that, you know, and, sure. and kind of building on that and trying to figure out what's like an actual progression that would be helpful for someone to maybe build up to blog down or things like that. So I'm kind of excited about uh, thinking more about those kinds of tools and instead of I think people doing like you know distill versus blog down which should I do thinking more about like what are the pros and cons for each one when would you want to choose one over the other um, and building those out and trying to figure out like what are the best use cases for those so it's been really fun for me to look at examples in the community for ways people have used those different tools for different things uh, and that's been just pretty inspiring so that's been kind of my fun summer project nice how about you man what kind of projects or ideas um, do you have so I I try to use for whenever I'm teaching. The, so I'll, I'll, I'll give a different example. I'll give like a course that I teach at the university setting. So I teach R in it. So I build every single component of it with R. So the course website is a blog down page. The slides are made with Sure Engine. The labs are written with R Markdown. So every single piece is an R piece. And um, I think I now have things working at a point where if I build the blog down site for the course, it like re-renders my slides and stuff as well if they need to be re-rendered. So basically what this means is that when you're teaching, if you realize that there's some sort of a typo in your slides, which always happens, and you actually go ahead and make that fix in R with just like a one button or one line of code, you can actually update the slides that are posted on your course website. You know, I think that's like really nice because in the past I remember, I mean, if you think about a completely different workflow, if you have slides for teaching that say you made in Keynote, which I love for other reasons, you would have to probably export it out to a PDF, drag that <laughs> PDF into a website, oh, wait for yes. it to upload, yes, right? Yes. So these are not necessarily like bad things and they're not things you can't live with, but it's so nice to see that whole ecosystem. And one of the things I like about it is that in an introductory data science course, I don't teach people blog down. I mean, they use R Markdown, but I don't teach people blog down and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But they get to see me doing it. So, you know, they'll ask the question, oh, you made that site with R? And maybe, maybe that's the end of that conversation. And all they learned is, hmm, you could build sites with R. Maybe one day I'll learn it. Or sometimes what happens is I'll come to office hours and be like, how would you do that? Show me. And I think that's like such a nice thing to be able to show, um, right. even though it's not part of the course that I'm teaching. And the fact that these things work together is really nice. Now, on the other side, sometimes the internal plumbing of these things can be confusing. <laughs> uh, and the other that. thing that I will 
quote unquote complain about, but I will fully accept that it is me who brings it on is I try to customize things. I like things in a certain color palette. When I teach, I try to use the Pantone colors of the season for my website, so I have to update them. Well, that means I have to write some stuff in CSS, oh, which I boy. never learned. I don't know if I'm refusing to learn it. Every year I ask myself, if I just made myself like sit down and learn it for a week, will the pain go away the rest of my life? Maybe it doesn't. So I, I get into this rut of almost like knowing just too much to be harmful, but not enough to be able to get around things quickly. So I don't know whose fault it is, <laughs> but I, I, I do in my heart wish some of this was a little bit easier to customize without having to feel like I should be an CSX expert. Yeah, I feel exactly the same way you do because I've been, in fact, you mentioned sharing it for helping your slides. I'm using that as an opportunity to know more about CSS because that is basically one of anyways purposes. Uh, if you're a CSS, you know, at least competent at that, you can do anything you want with it. And so I remember when I made slides for this advanced art markdown workshop talking about that officer package, I wanted to do it really different. I did a different theme. Well, I didn't make the theme. Someone else made the theme, and I did little tweaks here and there. But it forced me to say, okay, how does this all relate? And is it easy? Oh, gosh, no. no I, this is not natural to me in the least. And I've been doing R for years, so, but it's just a different mindset. But I think there, there are times you miss that opportunity to just click something and have it magically change. You have to think a little bit under the hood, but... Yeah, it's always like the balance of it. Should I just bite the bullet and just do it for a couple of weeks and just don't do anything else, just master it so that I don't feel like I'm Googling every time I get the CSS tag wrong or something? I don't know if you all had that too, but I always feel like a deer in headlights sometimes. So I, I feel like that's actually one of the things that I feel like we, like in my ideal world, we would do a much better job at giving people at least like a template structure for being able to customize those things. Because especially sure. when you're in a company or an academic institution, Institution, you want to be able to have the logo or there's a style guide. Um, you know, I remember the fonts from OHSU quite well. Um, <laughs> and I always needed to feel like I was kind of on brand. Um, and I feel like one of those things that's uh, kind of actually easier in blog down is that, um, especially if you use like the Hugo academic theme. So I recently did like a summer of blog down kind of training with our interns to teach them how to make their own websites using blog down. And that was one of the things that I got really enthused about with the academic theme in Hugo is that he gives you this really nice like a tomo file which is basically just metadata with keys and values but he sort of extrapolates out from the CSS the main things that you'd want to change like the main sure. body font the main nav color the link yeah. color the hover color and he just parameterizes it so that you have you know main underscore color yeah. <laughs> and equals and then you put in a hex uh, there and then there's only like six you know possible values there and you create your own tomo file and then that gets parsed into the CSS but you don't actually have to touch the CSS file um, and I I feel like that's actually a really powerful thing that I wish we could do that for more of the the down family, I guess, uh, sure. is being able to say like, okay, you know, if you wanted to customize, like we could isolate these like 10 or so things that probably you're going to want to change uh, if you want to have any control over the looks of your document and you don't want it to look like the default template. Um, you know, is there an easy way that we could kind of, you know, mask a little bit of CSS for people so that you don't feel like uh, as ineffective as I do often when I'm wrangling <laughs> with CSS? So I think that would be actually really cool for any of the other packages or if any Hugo theme uh, developers are out there, I feel like that's actually the Hugo academic theme is like does a really amazing job of helping you to change the look of your site immediately without needing to dig into the CSS file. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I think you and possibly the academic author have made this um, newer repository called Project Kickstarter. Oh, he did that? Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, but either way, that was a great jumping point for me to learn this a bit. And um, I actually used the academic thing for my sister effort, the uh, Shiny Developer Series. It's worked really well for me. I was able to put video embeds in there too, and it's all nice and clean. And, and just I didn't have to fuss with it much after I got that initial post template set up. So I'm really glad that Hugo in particular has all these different themes. But I'd say the academic thing can probably fit a lot of needs for a lot of people. So we'll put a, a link to that in the show notes as well. Um, so I'm going to kind of wrap this up with more of a fun question. Um, all three of us are parents of small kids, and I've always been curious from your perspectives if you want them to get into data science and what kind of things would you, how would you maybe approach that a bit? I know it's an odd one, but 
<laughs> who wants to tackle that? <laughs> so my my son is two and a half years old, and so I'm not sure how I would get him yet into data science, but I think the way it would be um, about collecting some data first, like oh, probably sure, yeah. doing like a tactical data visualization type thing, like they collect the data and they try to, you know, I think I've seen Carl Broman's kids do that. They do histograms with Halloween candy and stuff <laughs> because I can see that being able to jump onto something like, um, you know, if he's maybe a little bit older and he can type, type this data into a Google form. And then um, one of the things I've done this past year with, um, for this program for fourth to sixth grade girls is we collected, we had them fill out Google forms. So that's how they collected the data. And then we had a learn our document that I wrote that just read the Google form data that we collected in class. It was like, what's your favorite chocolate, whatever. And I had some of the code already embedded, so they just had to hit run. And then we did things like change the bars of the colors to match the chocolate kind. So if it's dark, we'll make it a darker color. Neat. So uh, perhaps a little gimmicky. What w worked is that it was data about themselves, which I think kids enjoy. Yes. The, they were involved with the data collection process, but they didn't you know, have to think about... A spreadsheet or anything like filling out a form for that age kid was kind of like second nature and then learn R made it really easy like our studio cloud makes it easy to learn R. that's one thing but i think that's like a really nice way of being like go to this website and push a few buttons but now let's actually customize things so i think that like when he's a little bit older i can see hopefully he will enjoy something like doing this sort of data collection-y <laughs> process. Um, but I, I will mention one thing that this is not so much about data science, but I do have a project that I've been working on kind of on my own time. It's a package called Lullabyer. I don't think it's ever going to be in on Crank because it's not meant to be, <laughs> but it is like on my GitHub. And um, so right now, for example, it generates random words for the alphabet song. So A oh, is for Apple, wow. but you can do okay. it for other things. I, I find it really fun. <laughs> and so sometimes I'll just like run that code and we'll read from it. I mean, my son has no idea what we're doing, but we'll let us <laughs> do it. So I think I'll, I try to sometimes like build functionality into it whenever I feel like he gets into something. That is cool. Nice. <laughs> okay, so you're way ahead of me. <laughs> um, I am so deep into potty training right now that I can't even think about anything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not quite. Not no, quite yet. there's yep. there's no easy solution no. there. Um, <laughs> I yeah, I mean, I think um, I think my daughter is uh, is showing some really intense interests in so many different things, and it's so cool to see. Um, she's two and a half, I think, about the same age as your um, your son, um, and uh, and so it's really fun to see just how those are going to evolve. I think um, sure. seeing the things that she's picking up on and kind of following those interests. So I hope that. You know, having a mom that does data science and is more in tech, I hope um, at least shows her that that's, you know, possible as a role model. And I hope that what I can kind of infuse her with is like a little bit of, you know, as she grows up, some data literacy at the very least, even if she's not inspired by the actual field that I'm in. Um, <laughs> but, you know, being a little bit, you know, uh, the healthy bit of skepticism, I guess, about data and, you know, understanding where it came from, the provenance right. of it, who's taking care of this data, um, you know, who's touched it, who, what assumptions were made, um, things yeah. like that. I, I, I really hope that at the very least I can kind of teach her to think along those lines, whatever she ends up doing. She's really into music right now. Um, she's like got a little play piano and she loves like hitting the keys and singing at the same time. So cool. I'm just hoping that she's just going to keep following her, <laughs> her passions and maybe they'll end up aligning with my own. But, um, at the very least, I hope I can, uh, teach her how to think about data in a way that's smart. Yeah. Well, um, I'm, I'm kind of going a little slowly on this, but my oldest is really into Legos as many kids are. So what I try to do is show them a hook of well, Legos is not just about the bricks. There's actually data behind the bricks, so to speak. And what better way for me to do that was to make a Shiny app. <laughs> and this actually informed my uh, Shiny contest submission where I took a package from uh, Ryan Timp, who made the Brick R package. He's still iterating on a lot. I made a Shiny app to simply use his functions to let him upload a picture and turn into a Lego mosaic that he could potentially build later on. But I figured, well, if I show them something visual, kind of like what you were all saying earlier, hit them with a nice visual and show them ways of tweaking it, 
Sure, that app is way more complex than any seven-year-old should probably deal with, but the idea is that this is the stuff we can create with this tooling and data is behind it and through. So I'm gonna try and use examples like that to get the hook. Still, he saw it once and now he doesn't wanna see it again for now, but you know, maybe when he's a little older, we'll, we'll get there. But, um, but yeah, those are, those are great stories. Um, so before we completely wrap up, why don't you tell our listeners uh, kind of the best ways to get in touch with you if they want to ask you about the work you're doing and what kind of things you're working on currently. Um, well, uh, this is Allison again. Um, I am uh, working basically in the open on the uh, our studio dash education GitHub organization. So you can track and see kind of the workshops that we're working on. Um, uh, I try to label the ones that I'm working on actively as in progress. <laughs> um, so keep in mind that I do not have the ability to make those private. Um, so you're seeing me live working. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm iterating and changing, but I like to use uh, GitHub and my workflows to maintain version control so you can see what we're working on but you know keep in mind that those are not necessarily finished products yet um and uh i'm excited at the end of the summer we hope to have a, a project um called our studio for education which will be some tools for educators around using r and our studio and our markdown um, so uh look out for that um but getting in touch i'm on twitter um i am a prez hill a p r e s hill uh, because my maiden name was Presmonis, uh, so <laughs> it's not uh, April, as some people think. It's Apres Hill. <laughs> um, and then I'm also Allison at rstudio.com if you want to get in touch. Yeah, I, um, yeah, Twitter is a good place to get in touch with me. I'm Mina Bojek. If you have any listeners from Turkey, they know what that means. Otherwise, it's just a random string of letters that starts <laughs> with my name. <laughs> it means Mina Bug. That's what my sister used to call me. It is oh. not at all professional. <laughs> and I'm also Mina at rstudio.com. And I think over the summer, I'll continue to iterate on the data science course in a box project as I both ramp up for my academic teaching in the fall. And also, I got to present on it a few times over the summer. And I've gotten some more interest in it. And faculty have been getting in touch. They've been using it, but also have been equating issues. Great. So that's probably what I'm going to be working on mostly. Cool. Yeah. We'll put a link to that yeah. in the show notes. That's a really great yeah. project. Keep an eye on it too. Well, thanks both of you for joining me. I know it's, it takes a lot of your time for doing this, but I've really been admiring your efforts and I'll be keeping that eye on that repo closely and what you do going forward. So, all right, everybody, we'll be back right after this. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, that discussion we had. Um, I do apologize for the, maybe the noise level you may hear on, on that recording. We, um, it's funny every time I, I try to sit down and do one of these, um, these, uh, great conversations on, on site at these places, there's always the challenge of, can we find somewhere that is kind of quiet, but you know, a little out of the way. And we were able to find a little table in front of one of the um, rooms that they were going to have one of the um, late night events at, but yeah, you always get people kind of walking by and, and oh, those people are holding mics. What are they doing? <laughs> so, but yeah, hopefully you enjoyed it. You can get the most out of that. Um, but lots of interesting takes on, I think I, I harped on it in the beginning of the interview too. I think no matter what setting you're in, you've got to find an effective way to hook your audience or hook your students so that you don't lose them along the way into some technical detail that they can't overcome. So really the idea of visualization being that first hook and just tweaking that a little bit, and then kind of showing that you're human, so to speak, and that maybe things don't go perfectly, but giving them a safe space and not only a safe space to ask you questions on how to debug an issue, but seeing you, the teacher or instructor, go through these and how you yourself troubleshoot it. I think that's missing from a lot of tutorials you see online, but I'm hoping that with the advent of things like, you know, what in the, in the R tooling itself, packages like Learn R that let you and your students like try out code and see if it breaks or not, but they let you kind of try again, get hints and things like that. But I think giving them a little glimpse on what you've learned in debugging or, or troubleshooting issues can go a long way than to just turn them loose on something without having that 
safe environment to ask without you know feeling ashamed of it and but also seeing that all of us that have been doing this no matter how long or how short we've been using R, we all have to deal with this once in a while and just the simple google searches or even stack overflow searches can go a long way to opening the eyes of your your students to say that these resources are out there and really don't be afraid to make a mistake here and there. I hopefully, I know I've been able to take that mindset, um, hopefully the heart, especially with some of the newer stuff I've been learning with some advanced shiny techniques and advanced simulation techniques. I tend to fail a lot, <laughs> so it's good to be able to navigate through that, but hopefully I can help others that when I do these little internal workshops or maybe a future workshop at one of these conferences, who knows, um, I can help them navigate these issues as well. So I think there's a lot of good things to take away from that conversation. And we'll have links to all those great resources that Allison and Mina mentioned in the show notes as well. So yeah, I think that's going to wrap up episode 31. I have to get packing soon. <laughs> I have an early flight tomorrow. But um, again, JSM, it's always... Um, it's different than other conferences. Um, it's definitely got a more traditional vibe to it, although I do see some newer thinking emerging in certain topics. But you, as you can imagine, it's definitely a heavily academic influence conference. You do see a lot of industry stuff as well, I must say. But the vibe can be different than you might see at something like our studio conf or use R. But uh, but in any event, I was able to, again, get lots of great things out of my experience and hopefully others that attend are able to get great experiences as well. And I hope you enjoyed hearing some of my takeaways and maybe it gives you ideas to pursue going forward. So, yeah, um, hopefully we'll be back with episode 32 sooner than later. Um, until then, please feel free to send me your feedback um, on the show at... Um, the contact page at r-podcast.org slash contact. And yes, that site is definitely powered by Blogdown. Uh, I've mentioned that before and I'm very happy with it. And then um, if you want to reach out on social media, our, our Twitter account is at the rcast. And also keep an eye out for a future uh, Shiny Developer Series webinar coming up in early August. Um, we will be very excited to talk about user interfaces more in depth with David Grangin. I'm really excited for that session. And yeah, um, definitely keep in touch and hopefully we'll enjoy the rest of the episodes. So until next time. End of line. <laughs>